All right. Well, with that, um, it is my pleasure to introduce Shay Hokolaski, uh, our speaker today, who's going to talk with us a little bit about intimacy and how to um, maintain those connections and the importance of those connections and, and all things related to the, the importance of connection and intimacy in your care partner role. She graduated from nursing in 2002 from BCIT and began working as a rehab nurse at GF Strong in 2003. And she joined the Sexual Health Rehabilitation Service um, as a clinician in 2004. Uh, in her sexual health clinician role, she's involved in research, education, and direct client care. She sees clients with a variety of neurological conditions, she has also co-authored numerous publications in the area and has participated at national and international conferences on the topics of sexual health and disabilities and has a very keen interest in assisting people to optimize their uh, sexual well-being. And I had the good fortune of, of a sneak peek at her slides, and I think you guys are all in for a really wonderful uh, workshop with Shay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's get this. There we go. Um, did you want, do you have the, like, it just, you can see, only see me, right? We can only see you. That's okay, right. Perfect. I can still see people. Okay. Just wanted to yeah. check. Um, yeah. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending um, today's workshop. I also want to thank Elaine for setting it up and that lovely introduction. Um, so my talk is called Intimacy and Relationships, Tip to Maintain or Restore That Spark. Um, I mean, it was really to peak interest. I think what I should have really labeled it was more just about getting back to the basics. Um, because essentially that's my goal here, okay, is to is to get back to the basics, to really to simplify a really complicated concept into some really easily digestible pieces. So I think in the promotional materials for the talk, um, this was sort of the outline. So the ad, the objectives to, you know, explore different types of intimacy, the common struggles with juggling roles as both care provider and partner, and then um, providing some strategies to maintain or restore intimacy in your relationship. Um, but I, I want to be real here for a second. So my goal here is not meant, this talk is not meant to be prescriptive in any sort of way. I'm not going to rattle off a million to do things um, to add to your list or an already very large list likely. Um, and I really, you know, really want to try my best to sort of reframe how you think about this area of your life with your partner and, and with the idea of ha finding some glimmers of connection. Okay, I'm also going to, so we went back and forth about whether or not we were going to record this session. I did set it up in a way so that um, it, it can live on because there's a lot of people who really, you know, you guys all showed up and I think that's like, thank you so much. Um, but there's a lot of people who, you know, aren't necessarily ready to sort of be in a discussion and, and just want to get information. And so I think that's sort of why we decided to record it. So what, how I've done it is I've set it up where I'm going to ask questions and have pauses throughout um, the talk today. And these questions are just for you to ponder um, honestly within yourself and they don't need to be shared. So this idea is you can just sit back and listen and digest the pieces, be open with yourself, answer the questions for yourself um, without that sort of worry of having to, to share. And then the idea at the end with all the things that you've jotted down, we'll have a really great opportunity at the end once the recording is stopped, because I think it's really valuable to be able to speak with each other, not just listen to me, Gab, but to sit with each other um, and, and discuss, you know, openly, you know, what the thoughts were prompted, how you're feeling, you know, the strategies that provided all of that stuff. So um, in to get us going, I will start with just some of the basics, like, what is sexual health? Who am I in my in my department? Who is my who is my um, team? Whoops, which is what I'll do here. I'm also going to discuss the concept of sexuality, um, the sexual health principles with which I work within, and then we're going to look at the definitions of desire because we can't have a conversation about intimacy without actually talking about desire as well. 
So here is my team. Um, so I am part of what we call the Sexual Health Rehabilitation Service. Um, we're actually a nurse-led service, very unique to, um, well, we're, we're nurse-led service in BC. We're unique in that we're actually the only service that is solely on sexual health in the whole country. Mm -hmm. um, we see anybody with a neurological disability. So that's anything that affects the brain and spinal cord. Um, and we do have a sexual metaphysician that's Dr. Elliot in the middle in the pink, and she consults to our service. So um, any medical questions or anything that we need, we do have uh, a, her ability to consult with us um, with some strategies. So this is our, our beautiful team here. Um, oh, oh. So now my thing doesn't want to advance. There we go. There we go. So I figured the best way to start off our conversation today is just talking briefly about what sexual health is. Um, the World Health Organization has a really great definition. So um, I usually just read out their definition because it's very inclusive. So the sexual health is the integration of the physical, emotional, intellectual and social aspects of sexual being in ways that are positively enriching and that enhance personality, communication, and love. Sexuality is also part of the larger concept of intimacy, right? Um, so I felt like we needed to have some of this information as well. And I, when we're talking about sexuality, I like to quote a uh, sex educator and colleague of mine, Corey, Silverberg from Ontario, and he makes a differentiation between sex and sexuality by saying sex is what we do and sexuality is who we are. Okay, so sex is what we do, it's an act, and sexuality are all of those pieces that make us a very unique people, right? Very, you know, very unique person. Um, and you can see it includes a lot, like it's complex, it, it, it encompasses a lot of different aspects. Of, of human nature, right? Um, and there's also a lot of these parts that can be affected by chronic illness. So that's chronic illness for your partner, but as a partner of someone with a chronic illness, these aspects are often heavily affected for you as well. So in my work as a sexual health clinician, um, we look at sexual difficulties through the lens of these principles, right? So when there's a chronic condition or illness um, involved, there's a lot of aspects of, of health and function that can't be fixed, right? I, I People always coming to me to be fixed, but there's a lot of elements um, with a chronic condition that just are. And so in order to sort of manage sexual health and sexual well-being we we look at it through these lens with this lens of you know um focusing on abilities so that's one optimizing potential but focusing on abilities um adapting to limitations so figuring out new ways to get needs met and lastly um i like to encourage people to stay open-minded so i sometimes encourage or even maybe nudge or challenge people to try new things and so this try new things, remain open-minded, this is sort of where we're gonna focus on today. So I'm going to sort of say with that lens, if everybody can sort of just keep an open mind on the things that are discussed today. So I did a lot of digging. So when, when Elaine um, approached me to do this talk, I mean, I do speak about intimacy quite a bit. Um, I talk to partners, I talk to care partners, um, but I, I was really trying to figure out how I was going to set it up. And, and, you know, my goal was to sort of, like I had said, make it in very digestible pieces. So I wanted to sort of get back to the basics of like, what is intimacy? So I went to the good old dictionary because you can go on the internet and find tons of things, but the good old dictionary is usually quite simple. So that's where I went. And interestingly enough, I found these two definitions from the Oxford dictionary, Miriam, Miriam Webster dictionary, and they all kind of, came down to the same idea that intimacy is really just a way to maintain closeness in a relationship. So when I'm using the word intimacy today in our, in our discussions and in our talk, that's sort of what I'm really wanting to depict, that intimacy is about closeness. So sit with that for a second. Maybe this is a great time to ponder, what does closeness look like for you? Maybe you can visualize that. 
And in thinking about that, is it any different than when I say intimacy? So kind of keep that in the back of your mind, closeness. What does that feel like? What does that look like? You know, I did a little bit more digging, of course, and um, was able to find this really great quote to take it a little bit further and kind of talks into about the context of what's necessary to feel this closeness. So intimacy is a one-on-one -on -one connection that involves a synchrony between two people. If you want to feel intimate, the first thing you and your partner need to do is stop all the other things you're doing and give each other your undivided, undistracted attention. Huh. How many of you actually get that kind of time with your partner? I'd hedge a bet that most of you don't. Also, when we're using the word intimacy or closeness and it's presented, the most common, I think, um, definition or the most common sort of type of physical uh, type of intimacy that people sort of think of when that word intimacy is used is usually the physical intimacy. So intimacy means physical touch. But in actuality, it's important to note that there's a there's a lot of different types of intimacy or ways to feel close with your partner. So I found you can see probably in my my um my notes in the corner here 1975 and 1981 so i went way back in the archives to find on the internet there's a bunch of different things that list all the different types of intimacy but no one ever gave anybody credit so we went back to the archives and found um this olson and schaefer article that actually created this personal assessment of intimacy and in relationships this pair uh measure um that talks about five key elements of intimacy. And I thought this is really, this is it. This is, this is what we're going to present today because this is, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because you can connect and be close with your partner, not just physically, but so many other ways. And so social intimacy means having common friends or similar social networks. So being out socializing with other people. Emotional intimacy is being vulnerable, being able to share feelings, all the feelings. Um, recreational intimacy is sharing experiences, right? So that can be hobbies um, that you do together, travel, so going out or going out to live music, anything where it's a recre recreation and something that you're doing together um, and having a shared experience. There's also this concept of intellectual intimacy. So this meeting of the minds type closeness where you're able to share ideas, bounce ideas off of each other, maybe even challenge each other intellectually. And then of course, there's the physical parts of intimacy where there's the touch and physical um, affection. These circles are all interrelated, right? So you can see that I've done that on purpose and that's because they all influence each other but they may not all be the same size for each of you, right? So some of those circles may have different degree of intensity or importance, depending on what's happening in your life, um, depending upon also the personality of each partner. Um, there also may be other aspects of intimacy that I don't have written here um, that you would like to add. One that people often add is spirituality. So, you know, another reflection point would be here is what are the most important aspects or forms of intimacy for you in your relationship? Are they the same as your partners? And maybe even making a mental note if they've changed. It might also be that intimacy just isn't on your mind. So it's really common um, when we're when, when the physical intimacy changes in a relationship, if it's avoided or non-existent, then a lot of those other aspects of intimacy actually diminish. 
So once the physical touch diminishes, all those other great things also kind of go away. And, you know, this, this is a common statement that I hear from partners in my clinical work. So this idea that with all of the tasks I have to do, I just don't have that loving feeling anymore. I just don't have it in me. I wonder how many of you have also felt this way. So a common reason for decreased intimacy in a relationship is that the caregiving tasks have taken over, right? And has made it really difficult for the care to see their partner in a romantic way. So when we're talking about that loving feeling, every time I hear that word, I think of that song. Um, you probably all can hear it too. Um, but what we're, what we're talking about here with that loving feeling is, is really sexual desire, this idea of sexual desire. So I think that's a really good place to start and kind of before we launch into a whole bunch of other what to do and, and everything that we need to sort of understand what sexual desire is and how it motivates us to be intimate or the other cycle. So did you know that there's actually two types of desire? Most people don't. Um, so there's spontaneous desire and there's responsive desire, okay? So spontaneous desire is what I think is portrayed mostly in the media. So that's what people think of the most, is that this sort of like innate physical need or want without any sort of sexual cues that kind of comes on spontaneously with this idea of, I want to be sexual. So there's more of like, I think people would say like an impulsive desire for sex. Um, some individuals have some individuals have a lot of it for their lifespan. Some individuals not so much um, or not at all. Okay. And, and what's more common is actually this idea of responsive desire. So it occurs in response to sexual cues. So this idea that you're not like being sexual or affection isn't really sort of in your forefront of your mind. You're kind of neutral about it. Maybe there's a hug or a caress, or maybe there's an actual overt sexual advance uh, through your partner, by your partner, and your brain goes, hmm, okay, let's give this a try. All right. And then when you give it a try, then all of a sudden your body responds, and that's responsive desire. Like, okay, this is actually quite nice. I'm, I want to go ahead with this. I'm going to give the green light. I'm going to go ahead. So this is actually the most, um, the most uh, common form of desire, especially in long-term relationships. Right? You're not in that lusty phase anymore in your teens. You're more thinking like, all right, well, let's give it a go and let's see how it goes. So that responsive desire. So give me, bear with me here. I didn't realize that all of this had, it wasn't just one particular slide. I'm not showing you this. I'm not going to go through all of this because we could probably have a whole session just on sexual desire itself. Um, so I'm not going to launch into every single aspect here. Why I'm showing you this is because it is so complicated, right? So this idea, this concept of desire has a lot of moving parts, right? Even just reasons for sex, this idea, um, there's there's even different reasons to be sexual. Sometimes there's the, the approach reasons, the actual reasons of wanting to feel close, wanting to feel cared for, wanting some pleasure, um, which are positive, but there's also some maybe reasons that are like more negative so these avoidance reasons meaning okay i'm just going to do this because it's what my partner needs i'm just going to do this because you know usually we get in arguments if we haven't been sexual so i'm just going to go ahead and do this or i'm just going to meet their needs because it just makes them happier and i'm just going to do this just because but you can see that the reasons for being sexual are also going to sort of impact or influence um the outcomes right so if you're going leading with this idea of you know, I want to be close versus, okay, let's just get this over with. What kinds of sexual stimuli you have are going to be different, right? You're either, are you getting enough stimulus that you're able to enjoy yourself? Or are you just rushing through things to get it over with? The context has a huge play here too. So do you have privacy? Is your partner's breath okay? I always say that because that's always one that people always chuckle at. Um, but it's true, right? These are things that are going to affect you. Um, are, are you distracted? How, what's going on in your mind? Can you be present? And that kind of goes back to the brain, right? It's really your most um, important uh, part for sexual function. It's your biggest sexual organ in a sense. So anything that's going on biologically or social, psychologically, so hormones, right? Also mood are going to have a big influence as well into how you go through this cycle. 
the idea is that when everything is good, when your motivation is good, when you get the right sexual stimulation, the context is right, you're engaged, not distracted, um, it, it can lead to sort of more of that triggered desire. And then there's that urge to sort of want to do it again. So if the positive outcomes are there and you think, well, that was really nice, you stick that in your brain and you go, okay, that's in the memory bank. Like, I want to do this again. But when everything doesn't align and there's this sort of loss of like the, the it just doesn't, it just doesn't, it's like, why bother? This wasn't fun. I don't want to do this. Then, you know, it makes sense why that loving feeling we talk about or that sexual desire would be down. Right. So that's my main point here is that there's a lot of things that are going on. And so it makes a huge amount of sense why that loving feeling might be lost. So I kind of made a note last in the last slide just about how your brain is your biggest sexual organ. Well, I really like to um, show this slide. Just it's 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 an old colleague of mine. I shouldn't say old. She's since retired. Um, Dr. Verna Amel had written this um, kind of pictograph showing the brain working like an office. So there's the frontal brain, so that's the doing brain, which is just thinking and planning and decision making and organization. So we call them kind of the vice presidents. And then um, the back part of your brain. So I think the amygdala and the limbic system. So the, the, that's more of your feeling brain, your thoughts, your emotions, your sensations, your memories. They all kind of live in the back here. So the reason why I'm showing you this today is that being in a relationship which, where you're providing care. I can guarantee you that this fronting, this front brain, the doing brain, it's working really, 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 really hard, right? And it's taking over. It's taking over. So it's doing all of the work. And it doesn't give a lot of opportunity to reflect on what's happening with the workers. That's that feeling brain, um, the emotions and, and connecting with, with memories. So the front brain is doing a lot of the work. The back brain, brain is kind of just on autopilot and it's not really getting a lot of time to shine. So think about this from, remember when I talked at the beginning about the context that's necessary for being intimate, where you need this undivided, um, uninterrupted time together. Not having that time does not allow this feeling brain to be activated because you're just doing. Having that time can then get you to pull out some things and activate that feeling brain. Right? So by activating that feeling brain, then maybe there's that ability to sort of see things differently, to maybe even have time to sort of want to feel a bit more close. Maybe, maybe not. So now, um, you know, we just went through a whole pile of things about talking about why perhaps the loving feeling might be lost. We also need to look at um, the other aspects of caregiving that also get in the way. So this is also a common statement that I hear from, from partners. Um, you know, I'm just too tired. I'm just too tired. I, I just don't have the energy or time to put into reconnecting. Like, I, it, you know, it just, it's just not in me. Have any of you had those thoughts yourself? Just think about it yourself. I really don't think we can have a conversation about caregiving and intimacy without also talking about the consequences of caregiving. This is, these are really, you know, these are really real, really real consequences of caregiving. They're experiences that most of you probably have, maybe not all at once. Um, and I thought maybe what I'll do is, what am I going to do here? Oh yeah. I, um, I read a bunch of research articles on a lot of these, a lot of these areas. And in fact, one quote, um, was really kind of really stood out to me. And it was that, um, although, although chronic illness is known to affect the whole family, the partner is thought to be the most affected. So I'm going to read that again, because it's big. Although chronic illness is known to affect the whole family, the partner is thought to be most affected.
and that's likely because there's a lot of role changes that occur as well. You're the one that's there day in, day out, seeing all of the changes. Um, so I do want to point out that there are some, I mean, I've listed the negative consequences, but there is there is a positive consequence. So there is this, this concept of compassion satisfaction. And um, compassion satisfaction is the positive aspects of being a carer. So a sense of fulfillment, sort of, and this idea of feeling good about being able to provide that care at home where, where your partner is comfortable. Having it be present can actually offset the other negative consequences and be protective to the carer. So if you're able to have some of that satisfaction, then it may offset some of these other um, things that we're going to speak about, that I'm going to speak about in a minute. Interestingly, I did read in the same article, and I think that's the Lynch article here, uh, was that men tend to have more compassion satisfaction. And I think that has to do with just uh, maybe genderized roles, this idea that women are born into sort of more caregiving roles, maybe more so than men. And so when they are in caregiving roles with their partner, they're not already sort of maxed out. That's my interpretation of it. But I thought it was a curious fact and I debated on whether or not I was going to say it out loud, but I thought some of the women in the group might think that was interesting. Maybe the men as well. Um, okay, so this is, this is the time I'm gonna really talk about the heavy stuff, the negative consequences of being a caregiver. Um, and you can see here, the very first one is caregiver burnout. So basically caregiver burnout is the impact of the workload on the caregiver itself. So they're just, the amount of work that's necessary is just enough to sort of make you feel like you're fizzling a bit. Um, what leads to burnout? Burnout can lead, burnout can happen because you feel isolated, right? You can feel like there's a lack of appreciation. I'm doing all of this stuff, but no one gives me any credit for what I'm doing. Um, just the bare or just the sheer amount of work that's needed to be done in a day um, can lead to burnout. And then these feelings of not having control over the situation. Burnout can look lots of different ways. Um, it's can be a compromise in maybe your own physical health and self-care. So sleep disturbances, increased stress. I mean, I don't need to tell you this. You guys already probably are knowing it and living it, but I'm just putting it all out there. Um, limited time to engage in your own personal interests and activities, disengagement in general. So, you know, not being able to really be engaged in, in any activities or with anybody um, that you used to in your social system. Um, depression, loss of motivation, and sort of feelings of helplessness. So this is on the spectrum, right? I, in my research for this um, talk today, I, I don't usually listen to podcasts, but I found one that was quite interesting. And um, by, well, there's three women in the group. Uh, Ms. Brene, Brene Brown, I don't know if anybody is familiar with her. Um, I believe she's a social worker uh, with a PhD and an author, and she writes a lot about feelings and uh, um and she had uh, a she had a couple authors, so Emily and Amelia Nagoski, who are um, their sisters, but they've just written a book called Burnout. Like, and so I was like, okay, this is something that I've got to listen to. So in this discussion, they uh, Emily and Amelia Nagoski quoted um, this fellow. Herbert Furtenboiger. I don't think I said his name right, but that's okay. And but it, the reason why I'm sharing this is because he had a definition about the three components of burnout that I thought were really good. And I think that we needed, I needed to sort of put them out there today. So the three components are emotional exhaustion. So the fatigue that comes from caring too much for too long, a decreased sense of accomplishment. So the sense of futility that nothing that you do makes any difference. And the third component, depersonalization. So the depletion of empathy, caring, and compassion. And so that leads me really nicely into this idea of compassion fatigue. So compassion fatigue is essentially the strain in the empathetic relationship between the caregiver and the care recipient. So that's where things like feeling resentful sometimes towards your partner, uh, maybe a little bit contemptuous because you're in the situation can sort of creep up. 
lastly, and one of probably the biggest um, concept in sort of talking about and looking at the consequences of caregiving is this idea of caregiver guilt. So um, caregiver guilt is sort of all the things you feel bad for or feeling bad about the things you do as it's related to caregiving. So I went through and I found there's actually like questionnaires and a lot of research that's being done in this area now um, or in the past and now. And I was able to find this questionnaire um, that talked about 22 items, but also looking at like five different aspects of caregiver guilt. Um, I'm not going to bore you about all of them, but basically they're questions about um, maybe, you know, not doing a good job being a caregiver, questions about feeling guilt, uh, participating in your own self-care. So this is the idea of like feeling guilty for leaving your partner to go have some fun or leaving your partner with somebody else to be cared for so that you can get a break. Um, there's also guilt about neglecting other members of um, the family. And also this other interesting one that I found was having negative feelings towards other people. So this is this idea about resentment. So resenting or having feelings maybe of jealousy or envy of other people who are not in the similar situation to yourself. Um, another area of guilt that I hear quite a bit um, that wasn't in any of the literature, but it's something that I, I, or any of the literature that I could find, but it's something that I hear quite a bit is this guilt behind losing or this feeling of, of changing um, the way you feel about like attraction to your partner. So, you know, this idea is I'm not, I'm not maybe as attracted to them as I once, as I once was. And I'm putting that out there as one of the elephant in the room is that a lot of people are thinking it, but not very many people usually say it out loud. So I'm going to say it out loud as this is a very common um, area of guilt that I hear coming from partners. Uh, what else was I had? I have a list of things that I was going to, that I wanted to talk about. I want to make sure I cover them all. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of going to the dark the dark hole and talking about sort of all the negative things that are associated with caregiving, knowing that there are some positive things can can offset all of this, knowing that you likely don't feel all of these things all of the time. But I wanted to kind of put it all out there to say these are all real feelings and they're things that you know there's a lot of things that are on your plate. There's a lot of things that you have to do, um, and so you know tying back to that earlier comment is that it makes a lot of sense that perhaps if you're feeling any elements of this that you don't maybe have the time or energy to want to put into you know creating that spark like I said at the beginning and so out of that podcast this one uh, or this is actually from the book but um, this one quote kind of stood out for me and I just wanted to place it here so exhaustion happens when we get stuck in an emotion now, I think I wanted to put this here because I think it's quite true and probably pretty relevant for everybody that's participating here today. And so this might be a really great moment to maybe pause and reflect if there was any sort of emotion that stands out to you when I read this. Again, I'll read it again. Exhaustion happens when we get stuck in a, an emotion. So this burnout book is now on my list of things to read. <laughs> Because uh, I think it, it, the little bits that I did capture sounded really great. And I think they're really, um, I think it, I think it stands out for a lot of people, how they're feeling in life in general. Um, but the name, the book, the burnout, burnout, the secret to unlocking the stress cycle. Maybe this is something, maybe there's something there too, that if any of you are or audio book enthusiasts, maybe that's something to put on a, a reading list. But we're kind of, I just also to give myself a bit of a break in speaking, but I think that um, the now is a really great time to be a bit self-reflect, self-reflect and actually think about honestly how you're feeling. So I like this image of the gas tank. So how much gas do you have in your tank right now? Maybe it would be a great thing to think about um, placing a number on it. So from zero to 10, zero being, zero being completely empty. Um, and 10 being full, you know, where are you sitting today?
And maybe even thinking, do you ever actually get a chance to fill up? Like to full, or is it sort of like you get to half a tank and then you get depleted again? Are you on the verge of burnout or maybe right in the think of, thick of it? And like, do you have some compassion satisfaction still in your relationship that is kind of helping offset this a bit? So we'll come back to this, okay? I also want to take a moment. I've just likely sparked a bunch of heavy emotions. Um, so I wanna honor that. I also want to acknowledge that some of you might be in a place or have a partner that's significantly changed um, as a result of the injury and or disability. And so that they are not who you once knew them to be or know them to be. So when this happens, I think um, it's difficult or even maybe impossible to even want to get to a place of wanting to be intimate in your relationship with your partner. So I wanna say that these feelings are really okay and they're normal and that it's completely 100% okay not to want to, like not to want to be intimate, um, especially in the physical sense, okay? And my job here today is not to convince you otherwise. My job is not to get you to the other side and say, come on now guys, let's, let's try. My job for the rest of this talk is to provide perhaps, or ask you to keep an open mind and perhaps some of the strategies that we talk about can maybe ease your burden or switch your switch your perspective um, to find new ways to connect maybe with your partner, but maybe more importantly, to connect with yourself. So that you can experience some forms of closeness that we all as humans need. Okay? So I just wanted to put that in there. I think maybe we all need to take a deep breath, like nice breath in, nice breath out. So, you know, trying to figure out strategies. What do we do? What do we do to make things better, right? Where do we, where do we go now? What do we do? Well, in a lot of my reading, what I did find was that, um, and, and in my work that I do, I didn't just, I just didn't, yeah, never mind. Um, in all the reading that I did and all the work that I do, what we do know is that self-care is basically the biggest antidote to burnout and compassion fatigue. So that's, I kind of like thinking about self-care as, you know, when you're on the airplane and they say in an emergency, put your oxygen mask on before helping others. This is what um, self-care is essentially for, for yourself and for burnout. And as a caregiver, it's so often, I mean, we talked about it, or I mentioned it earlier, it's so, 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 so common to put your own needs and your own desires and your own interests and everything that you think about for yourself aside so you can focus on the caregiving tasks. So I found um, this great article that basically put self-care into six um, categories that I think will be really helpful here. So I'm going to spend a minute to, to chat about them. So this idea of physical self-care, the things I do to improve my body in healthy ways. So that's things as simple as, can I get a good night's sleep? Um, you know, can I... Can I get a nice healthy meal? Can I get some time to move my body? Can I go do some exercise and release some of that, some of that stress or pent up energy? Can I even take five minutes and maybe make myself my own doctor's appointment so I can get some of those things off the list that I need to sort of do for my own health and well-being? Then there's this idea of emotional self-care. 
the things I do to deal with my feelings in healthy ways. So that could be journaling. That could be talking to your support system. Maybe talking about your feelings or setting some time to be able to see, you know, a counselor or anybody to kind of help you sort out those feelings. Then there's social self-care, the fun stuff, right? The things I do with others and the world around me. So the fun stuff, you know, going out with friends, being able to, you know, meet with, with family members or other people in your life that like energize you, that can help you fill that tank. Uh, maybe that's celebrating milestones, successes. Maybe that's belonging to some sort of groups or communities or activities where it kind of gets you away from what your, you know, day-to-day -day activities are. Then there's also this idea of cognitive self-care. I like this one because it's it's this idea of things I do to improve my mind and understand myself. Hmm. That can be reading. So, um, that could be reading, it could be writing, it could be continuing education or just learning something new. Kind of exercising that 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 brain. Um, next, we have financial self-care. This one's often avoided. Like not many people want to talk about or deal with finances, but it's also something that all probably lingers in the background and kind of weighs heavy. And so being able to do some financial self-care, which are the things that I do to stay financially responsible. So that doesn't mean like um, stress shopping or going out, what do they call that Real retail therapy? That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is like, you know, balancing the bank book, maybe initiating or updating a will um, and establishing some plans for, for the future. So that's the one that I think is probably the least done, but maybe also pretty important um, to kind of offset some of that nagging or nigg niggling that you get about your to yourself and then lastly there's spiritual self-care so um i mean obviously that says things that i do to gain perspective in my life so some for some people that can be things like praying and meditation and um you know spending time in in house of faith but some other people it can be just being out in nature being one with the air the, the mountains the trees um can also be quite spiritual for people and 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 quite helpful to offset um, some of the burden. So I think, you know, it might be a great opportunity here to think about the things that like, are you doing self, are you doing any of this stuff? Are you able to do any of this stuff for yourself right now? Is there anything on this list that perhaps really piques your interest that like activities that you wanna try? And if there are, then maybe to, you know, to, to make a note of them and maybe I can sort of give you a nudge and encourage you to, to try to piece out some time um, to try them. Or if anything that you're doing, do they help? And maybe it's just about a matter of like being able to have more time to do that. So you can feel the benefits of that. So I did just, you know, spend a lot of time talking about caregiver guilt. So for here, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to go into all of it again, but what I want to do is sort of frame it to say, well, we know that when we talk about self-care, feelings of guilt are often sort of the ones that prevent you probably from taking the time to do that. And so that also led me back to good old Brene Brown, um, cause she talks a lot about guilt and shame. Um, and so I found it very interesting, like going back to the basics, she sort of describes guilt as, you know, something that's focused on behavior. So like I did something bad or a feeling of falling short on your own expectation or standard. So really you're feeling guilty because you're doing something that perhaps is maybe making you feel like you're not doing a good job maybe in the caregiving area. So you're like, oh, I'll, I'll sacrifice myself. I, I, I won't do all the things that I need to do. So these are all really real, right? These feelings come up, um, especially when we talk about self-care. So, you know, what? Are, why am I talking about it again? So the idea is that I want to sort of provide you with some ideas of how to manage like 
So if I'm feeling guilty, how do I manage that guilt? What are the things that I can do to sort of help offset that? Just like the self-care stuff. So there is some overlap. Obviously, self-care will help you alleviate feelings of guilt. And we know that research says that sort of the more that you do to manage guilt, it can be helpful in managing the negative consequences. So there's this um, quote here, kind of wordy, but I'll read it anyways. Early interventions targeting caregiver guilt and its maladaptive cognitions may lead to improvements in caregivers' psychological well-being. The, what does that actually mean? Well, that means essentially the less guilt you have, the better you're likely going to feel. So what we got to do is Benet Brown says that self-compassion and empathy are things that can really help combat feelings of guilt. So when I was making this slide, I was like, okay, well, that's all great, but how do we do that? So how do we create more self-compassion? How can we create more empathy? So that can look at something just as brief, you know, just as simple as doing something nice for yourself, giving yourself a break even if it's just five, 10 minutes. Maybe that's shifting your self-talk um, to show more loving kindness towards yourself. Like, you know what, I deserve this today. Or, you know what, I'm actually doing a really good job. Or maybe it's just, I'm doing the best I can today. But speaking to yourself in that way and not sort of always throwing in those, oh, I shouldn't do this. I. I feel really bad. So trying to switch the self-talk to be a bit more positive. There's also this concept of mindfulness, which is being way more talked about out in the world, but also in healthcare, which could be a really quite, quite a helpful tool. So that's what we're going to look at a little bit further. Um, so I'm going to sort of switch, switch it to this concept of, of mindfulness. So this Picture I find to be a really great depiction. So this idea of mindful or mindful. Um, it's really difficult to be very present and connected when your mind is very, very busy. So mindfulness is essentially, you know, it's a, it's a basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are, what we're doing, and not overly reactive, overwhelmed about what's going on around you. So mindfulness, we all have it within us. We just need to learn how to access it or have the time to learn how to access it. Essentially, mindfulness can be done basically anywhere, but it focuses on all five of your senses and staying in the present moment. So it can be done in the shower. It can be done while you're washing dishes. It can just be done simply by taking five minutes and taking five deep breaths. And you know, in talking about self-compassion and empathy, there are specific loving kindness meditations that can be done that can help. What do, how do I like harbor or start to sort of engage with that in, in, in and of itself? So, you know, a loving kindness practice can be really simple. And just by repeating a few positive, reassuring phrases to yourself, and that could be something as simple as, may I be happy? May I be safe? May I be healthy, peaceful, and strong. May I give and receive appreciation today. So you would repeat that a few times. So loving kindness meditation is just, may I be happy, may I be safe, may I be healthy, peaceful, and strong. May I give and receive appreciation today. So then it just gets repeated. And that can be a really nice antidote to the guilt and 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 add maybe some some empathy and, and self-compassion to yourself. So there is, if you Google mindfulness, there's a bazillion resources out there. Um, I'm just talking about a few, or I've just sort of talked about that one loving kindness. If this is something that interests you or something that you want more information on, um, please, you know, send Elaine maybe a, an email and I can send her a list of things um, to kind of get you started in, in, in this way that can, um, be like one strategy to help. Now, I know you probably heard all this before, and I, I'm not going to sit here and lecture about role, you know, role separation and trying to, but I feel like I can't have this conversation about caregiving and intimacy without making mention of this need of being able to find ways to separate, you know, your roles as caregiver to your roles as um, as a partner 
And so if anything, really I'm putting here as like a, a nice reminder that, you know, maybe you just need to ask to take a break sometimes. And perhaps carve out some more time about, you know, trying to sort of be in that role of partner again. And that can look lots of different ways. That can be just making time to laugh together, making time to meet each other where you are now, to try new things together, to try not to get past stuck in the past, and perhaps to maybe even reflect and, and cherish and talk about some old memories together. So as we get really close to the end of my presentation, um, I want to talk about this concept of adaptability in couples. And this is a quote that I found by Esther Perel, who's also um, a PhD and author. And uh, I think her, her focus is on relationships. Um, this quote I, I find, I don't know, I, I've always really liked it. I've sort of brought it into a lot of my other talks. So this idea that adaptability in couples is about responding to life's changing circumstances with good communication and a lot of flexibility. So she's also come up with a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions um, that can help questions if you answer them together or you ask them together to help build adaptability. So if you're gonna say this is something you should do, then there's actually nice to have some tools in which to kind of try to build that. Um, and so these are also great questions for you to be able to ask to kind of tap back into that feeling brain and activate some maybe some old memories or hopes for the future. So questions such as, when in the past did I feel most happy and connected with my partner? What can we take forward to help us thrive? What do we want to leave behind? What do we want to try that we never have before? How do we remind each other that we're in it together? Do any of these questions pique your interest? Good, because there's more. <laughs> um, what do we do when we're finding it difficult to adapt? What conversations need to be had? What affirmations need to be given? And how do we redistribute our resources to meet this moment and what we need right now? So there's a lot of questions and, you know, maybe we can, maybe those are questions that can get put into that one pager um, where they're written down and you can try. But I think there's a lot, there's a lot here. There's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in these questions that I think can be carried forward. So I know I talked a lot today and we're just about to wrap it up. But hopefully there was some new information presented or maybe presented in a way where you don't have to feel so heavy about all the things that you have to do. And maybe there's a way that I can encourage you to sort of look at intimacy in a different way. Maybe even, you know, notice if your perception on intimacy has changed from when you showed up today to now. And think perhaps if, you know, you're able to start to make your own definition, one that suits you as we leave today. And at the beginning, I promised I wasn't going to write a hefty list of strategies and add more to your plate. So I really want to honor that. And so, you know, this strategies isn't isn't a lot of things. I don't want you to leave here thinking that you have a bunch more things to do. What I want to do is encourage you to try to light that spark and foster that spark within yourself first. And then see where things can go from there. That's all, that's it, that's all. How do you try to foster or light that spark within yourself again first before anything else and see where that goes? So this is a great time to sort of stop. I want to thank all of you for, for, for coming today, for showing up, for listening. Um, I know your time is precious, so I feel very grateful that, you know, you, you showed up to, to share that time with me. 
hopefully it was helpful. Um, so we can stop it. I'll go through a couple of these slides just about, you know, if there's anything that, you know, made you feel like hmm, maybe I want to look into this a little bit more. Maybe I want to see if, you know, some one-on-one -on -one consultation, um, you are welcome to come and chat with me. Um, the referral form can be found here and I'll get um, Angela to perhaps cut and paste the um, website into the chat so you have easy access to that. Also, I wanted to have my contact information. So I want you to feel like you're able to access me if you have any questions or concerns or, or wanna have a quick chat, you can reach out to me by phone or email. I think that is that, my references. And then we can pause before we can stop, excuse me, recording. I've listed out all of the um, questions that I asked throughout the talk and we can spend the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so to see if we can have a discussion. Well, before I stop the recording, I do just want to take a moment to thank you, Shay, for for an amazing presentation with so many um, pearls uh, in there for, for us to take away. Uh, and, and then we can, uh, I am going to uh, stop the recording. So just give me a second.